Welcome to Raptorisms Over Crystallis, episode 11. Where we last left off, I had finally gotten out to the Angry Sea, only to discover that the enemies out there could not be damaged at level 8, so I need to level up a bit more, and that's why I'm back in the Portoa area. The last cave we explored in the Portoa area was in the northeast, and that's the cave where we found the fog lamp. This time we're in the southeast, and this one is going to give us the Cubisa plant. Unlike the fog lamp, which was pretty much necessary at this stage of the game to get out to the Angry Sea, the Cubisa plant isn't an item that we're going to need until basically the end of the game. There's really no pressing need to be here, and in fact, if you want to play this game the right way, you would go to another village and they would tell you that the Carissa plant is in this cave and then you'd come back here to find it, but you may as well kill two birds with one stone, find it now, level up, and then you never need to come back here again. You should know by now how experience points work in this game, it's all exponential. So you may as well clear any given area while you're at the most appropriate level and that way you can most efficiently get your experience points. Same with money, you may as well get that money while it's still worth something. While we grind and level up today, I want to talk about this course on Coursera that I just finished taking. It's the machine learning course taught by Andrew Ng. I hope I'm pronouncing that right, the name is spelled NG. To make a long story short, this course is really damn good, and if you're interested in getting into the basics of machine learning, I strongly recommend it. Alright, so let's continue through this cave for now, because I think we're almost at the end. As you can see, I'm just using the Sword of Wind right now. For one, this is the kind of cave that has rock walls, so of course we need to use the Ball of Wind to break those down. Also, a lot of the enemies here, not all of them, but a lot of them are vulnerable to the Sword of Wind. Okay, so now we're coming out to the final area, and over here, there's just this one enemy that flies around, but otherwise, this is the area where you'll find the Carissa plant. And there you go, you now have the Carissa plant, so let's get out of here. There's really no more business to take care of in this cave, and we don't want to be here any longer than we have to because you can't save in caves, and you're probably far from a town, so if you need to restore your health points or magic points, it's going to be hard to run away to an inn. So let's go back to Brian Mayer for now, let's rest up, and actually, instead of leveling up for now, let's head to the Amazon village, where even though we're not quite welcome there at this point in the game, we might be able to get a really useful item in any case. 20 bucks, nice and cheap, all Right, and while we're in town, let's check out the bar one more time. As you can recall, when we went to Mount Saber, there was the guy who died. That man is dead, isn't he? We'd still be alive if I hadn't told him. Yep, that's some survivor's guilt right there. Anyway, aside from this part of the bar, I don't think there are any other changes in this town since the last time we were here, so let's head outside and try to cross the river in this stage of the game. As you may recall, the enemies in this area of the game are most vulnerable to the Sword of Fire, but we actually don't want to get into any unnecessary battles because these guys are so weak compared to where we are now that they're not even worth killing to get the experience points, so let's just put on the Sword of Water and build that bridge. There we go, built that bridge, and let's cross over. Now let's just see if the enemies on this side of the river are any stronger than the ones that we came across before. And no, they are still pretty weak and easily killed in just one shot by the Sword of Water, so there's no point in leveling up here either. So let's head back down south, and that's where the village should be. Now these blobs over here, you can just stab them, you don't even have to charge up and you can take care of them in just one stab. That's how weak they are now, or at least that's how much stronger you've become. So let's hop over this patch, and we are now entering the Amazon village. Yow, a filthy man is here. Leave! Ack, I am insulted by your presence, man! I'd say that's pretty rude. Let's at least check out the inn, and it's 80 bucks, that's pretty expensive, but at least she's giving me the option to stay there. It looks like all the shopkeeps here know that they gotta do business, and so they're not gonna discriminate. Now the selection of armor here is actually really good. We could get the Platinum Shield and the Platinum Armor back in Portoa, but the Mirror Shield and the Sacred Shield, these are new items, and the Sacred Shield especially, at $9,000, is a great shield to have. Unfortunately, we only have 513 bucks on us right now. Stay away, I hate men, okay? This is the house of Aurelis, our leader. This is not a place for you. Well, we've had a moving guard before, so we know exactly what to do here. Let's bring out our paralysis spell and see if we can break into that house anyway. Here we go, sneak up on her. And let's just wait for this woman to get out of the way. And bam, she is frozen. Let's go inside, just try to avoid anyone. Aurelis the leader. She's probably not going to take kindly to us. Yep, let's just sneak into this back room here, and we're going to get an extremely great item, the Blizzard Bracelet. Like with the other bracelets, this maximizes the power of one of your swords. In this case, it is the Sword of Water. It is an extremely useful item to have, and is the first bracelet that you aren't automatically guaranteed to get. 
But we just got thrown out of here when we started talking to the queen, so there's pretty much nothing else we can do here right now. Except I guess buying the sacred shield, and in some of the other caves, we did come across those attacking treasure chests. If we can kill those, we can rack up money pretty quickly, so let's head over to one of those caves right now, do some leveling up, and while we do that, let's talk about the Stanford Machine Learning Course. A long, long time ago, in a land far, far away, I majored in computer science as an undergrad, and around the time I hit my third year, I started to think that maybe I don't want to spend my whole career just writing code for the next, you know, 30, 40 years of my life. So I started to weigh my options, I figured I was deep enough into my computer science degree that I would at least finish it up, but after that, I would run away to law school. Well, in recent years, I've been kind of thinking about getting back into computer science, at least kind of casually. Sometimes, yes, in a theoretical sense, computer science is relevant to my job as a patent attorney, it really depends on the client and the particular case, but I never actually have to do any programming myself, I just need to understand the concepts. But I don't want to lose any of my skills either, and yes, I'm sure that I've lost plenty since I've graduated, but I'd like to know that I could at least still do some basic programming. I'd heard about these MOOCs, these massive open online courses through websites like Coursera, and I'd figured maybe I could take one of these programming courses and get up to speed a bit. The course I want to talk about today, Stanford professor Andy Ng's machine learning course is one of the highest rated, if not the highest rated course on the site at 4.9 out of 5 stars. Just from browsing around the course listing, it seemed like a typical highly rated course would be around 4.5 out of 5 stars, so 4.9 is ridiculously high. Now you have two options for taking this course. The first is the free version, and that basically means that you can just watch all the lectures for free, and that honestly is probably most of the value of this course. But there's also the paid version, which comes with quizzes and programming assignments, and that's the version I did. It's not that expensive, it came out to like 8,000 or something yen, which is basically about 80 US dollars, and I got my job to cover it because they saw it as something that was potentially helpful to the business. The course is designed to run about 11 weeks, and the deadlines are adjustable so you can learn at your own pace. In any given week, you're going to do about 8 video lectures, and these lectures are about 7 to 15 minutes each. In the middle of each of these lectures, there's going to be some sort of tiny quiz just to make sure you're paying attention. The lectures are done by Andrew Ng himself, and true to the 4.9 out of 5 star rating, this guy is an amazing teacher. He is excellent at explaining some of these really technical concepts in a very intuitive manner. And one of the other things that he does really well is that he gives you a lot of practical advice in his lectures. You never feel like you're just watching the lecture version of a textbook. It feels like whatever he tells you, he cut out the unnecessary academic stuff and distilled it all down to what's really useful in the real world. Based on this, I would say that if all you do is just watch the free lectures, it is more than worth your time and you are getting plenty out of it. Now let's talk about the paid version. First of all, you're going to be taking some quizzes, and some of these quizzes are going to have challenging questions, but you can retake the quizzes as many times as you want until you get your desired score. There are no major tests, there's no monitoring software, you're just taking these quizzes based on the honor system. And if you really want to, you can keep retaking all of these quizzes until you get a perfect score on all of them. No one's really checking, no one really cares, you can just keep on taking these quizzes until you're satisfied with what you've learned. After all, these kind of courses are just for your own education. They're not really for credit or anything like that, although you are going to get a completion certificate if you do finish the paid version. Now let's talk about the programming assignments. You can do them in either MATLAB or Octave, and I used Octave, which is a totally free program. For MATLAB, it is normally a very expensive program, but you can get a free license just to use it for this course. These languages are pretty easy to work with, and the hardest part for most assignments is just making sure you're getting your matrix math right. Generally speaking, the matrix math, or the linear algebra if you want to call it that, is the hardest mathematical area of this class. Now there are other areas of math that are highly applicable to machine learning such as calculus and statistics, but this course avoids going into those areas in depth. The only area that they'll really beat you over the head with is linear algebra, and even then they don't go into it as deep as they really could have. Now getting back to the programming, one of the hard things you're going to have to do for some of these assignments is doing what's called a vectorized implementation of an algorithm. Basically that means that instead of going through for loops inside of for loops, you're going to try to get the same result using matrix operations, and that should make some of these programs work a lot faster and in some ways a lot more elegantly. This can be pretty challenging, but when you're stuck, you can always go to the Coursera message boards, and the answer you need is probably going to be in the FAQs, but if it's not, you can always ask the TAs for help. Now let's talk about some criticisms I have for the course, and I really don't have that many. Like I said, this is an amazing course, it is well deserving of its 4.9 out of 5 star rating, but if I do have some criticisms, 
For one, it may be a little old, and, you know, I don't practice in the industry, I wouldn't know this for sure, but I found out only after finishing this course that Andrew Ng is actually one of the co-founders of Coursera, and this was one of the first courses up there. That would have been in the early 2010s, and I don't know how many times this course has been updated since then, but it's at least a few years old, and some of the material may be slightly outdated. But once again, I wouldn't know for sure, and it might not even matter for an introductory course. My second criticism is that some of the slides are incorrect, and you'll only find out about that once you refer to the Coursera forums, or you're actually doing some of these programming assignments, and you're not really sure why things aren't working out the way you would imagine, so you go to the Coursera message boards and you find out there that there was a mistake on the slide. That can be annoying at times, but once again, the TAs are really on top of that and they will point out all the mistakes in the message boards. Finally, some people might not like the choice of language between MATLAB and Octave. It appears that those two languages were chosen because it's really easy to represent mathematical formulas with them, especially when it comes to matrix math, but it's my understanding that they're more for academic use than industry use. If you were looking to develop some programming skills in something like Python, you're not going to find it here. Also, by virtue of using these really easy to understand, highly math mathematical languages, some of the assignments actually come off as too easy. But then again, I have a degree in computer science, so if you have less of a technical background, the level may be appropriate for you. Anyway, those are really all of my criticisms, and like I said, overall I am extremely satisfied with this class. The estimated time that I put into it was about 5 hours per week, and you can basically break that down into 2 hours spread out over weekday nights for lectures, and then 2-5 to five hours for programming on weekends depending on the difficulty of the assignments. Now that I've just finished this class, I'm going to take a little bit of a break, but maybe starting next month, I'll sign up for one of the sequel classes, such as the series of courses on deep learning, also taught by the same professor. It's kind of weird to rate something that isn't an entertainment product, but what the hell, let's do it right here. Final grade, triple plus. Now let's check in with the game one more time before we call it a day. I am now up to power level 9, which means I can head out to the Angry Sea at any time. But while we're still in this cave, I want to kill some more of these fake treasure chests in order to get up to $9,000 so we can get that sacred shield from the Amazon village. You've probably seen enough of me killing treasure chests for one day, so I think in the next video I'll just skip ahead to when I have $9,000. That's all for now, so as always, if you like what I'm doing with these videos or if you like what I'm doing with my channel, like, comment, and subscribe. If there's any topic you want me to get to in a future video, just let me know. Alright, see you next time!